This UCSD TV program is a presentation of University of California Television for educational and non commercial use only. Kroc School of Peace Studies are honored to be hosting Professor Johann Galtung, who is one of the founders of peace studies and who has shaped the field in the last 50 years through his prolific writing, research, teaching, and applied peace work. Dr. Galtung is an extraordinary teacher and peace practitioner whose impressive body of work draws inspiration from many sources including Gandhian nonviolence, Eastern mysticism, medical sciences, Western enlightenment, and the full range of social science disciplines. He is truly a transdisciplinary and global thinker who has influenced successive generations of students and peace professionals around the world. Dr. Galtung celebrated his 80th birthday a few months ago. His students and colleagues are publishing yet another volume to honor his contributions to the field of peace studies. I'm thrilled that our students had an opportunity to meet him in person this afternoon and to raise critical questions we have been studying throughout the semester. It is not often that students get a chance to meet and converse with pioneers in their field. Professor Galton dates his early introduction to war and peace to the German invasion of his native Norway when he was only 12 and witnessed the arrest of his physician father. He was 18 when Mahatma Gandhi, the father of nonviolence, was assassinated. That left an indelible impression on him leading to his lifelong commitment to peace by peaceful means. When the time came for his obligatory military service, he elected to do 18 months of social service. After 12 months, he requested that the remainder of his social service be spent in activities relevant to peace. Instead, he was sent to prison for six months of solitary confinement where he was able to deepen his study of peace and nonviolence. <laughs> the Cold War and the threat of nuclear war galvanized Dr. Galtung and other pioneers of peace studies to search for new ways of thinking about war, violence, and peace. At the time, peace research was considered a very radical and even a dangerous idea. Luckily, the end of the Cold War opened up a new and more promising era for peace research. And there is some good news coming out of that research. Armed conflicts declined steadily in the decade prior to 2003, as various wars came to an end and the number of battle-related deaths fell significantly. Using Dr. Galtung's incisive terminology, the post-Cold War era saw an extended period of negative peace or the absence of overt direct violence. Unfortunately, this does not mean that the world is a safer place and that the sources of war and violence have been eliminated. In fact, there is new evidence that the number of armed conflicts has increased by 25% from 2003 to 2008. Moreover, there are both new and persistent threats to peace, forcing all of us to think about how to achieve what Dr. Galtung calls positive peace by addressing the structural sources of violence. Dr. Galtung has been celebrated 
as a provocative thinker, a social innovator, a tireless international activist. We in Peace Studies are proud to call him our intellectual mentor for inspiring successive generations to bring the best of human knowledge, creativity, and energy to address the roots of violence through research, dialogue, and conflict transformation. Dr. Galtung. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Tirgi, thank you so much for that lovely introduction. This is only to intimidate you. It's not for you to understand anything, but I am. Um, <laughs> The basic thesis that I stand for is very simple. Wherever there is violence, there is an unresolved conflict. Unresolved conflict means that there is an incompatibility of goals, including means, that has not been resolved, has not been superseded, has not been transformed, has not been transcended. That conflict can be direct between actors who have conscious goals. It can be structural between parties that have their interests. In other words, if you don't like violence, solve the conflict. You may, of course, try to do something with a violent party, eliminating, taking him out, in one way or the other incapacitating him. And in all likelihood, you have done nothing because the conflict is still there, unresolved. So how do we handle that? In row number four is about mediation. And the basic point, if I should say so, about the method I stand for is not to get the parties together around the table it is not to negotiate. It is not to arrive at a compromise. For light, simple conflicts, that's an acceptable approach. But what I stand for is a one-on-one -on -one meeting with a skilled mediator, one party at a time. For heaven's sake, don't bring them together. Don't have them talk too much with each other, because if they start understanding each other, it usually becomes even worse. You may be protected by lack of understanding. Have them talk. Have them talk freely, without the other party listening. Have them indicate where they see solutions without the other party saying, that's not what you said yesterday. Don't have them play theater, relax. So the one-on-one -on -one dialogue, there is a rule for the mediator that every sentence end with a question mark. You see, negotiation is continuation of war by verbal means, and every sentence usually ends with an exclamation sign. It's not the way to do it. And that's the reason why the French word for debate is debattre, meaning to beat. And the goal in the debate is to win the debate by cornering the opponent and having him strangulate himself in contradictions. That's not the way to do it. The way to do it is searching, questioning. So in doing that, there are stages. And you will find to the right, in row number four, three stages called mapping, legitimizing, and bridging. Mapping means who are the parties, what are their goals. In order to assess that, you have to meet all the parties. You have to make them feel comfortable. You have to make them feel that they have a listener who satisfies empathy. As everybody says, and I agree, empathy is not the same as sympathy. So mapping will always bring in more parties than you expected. 
and it will bring in a much more complex set of goals than you expected. I was once an observer to the Norwegian delegation to the Law of the Sea Conference, where there were 150 parties with 150 goals. That's a matrix, 22,500 combinations. Try to keep that one in your head at the same time. You have to reduce it. You have to reduce the complexity. And as you know, there is a kind of rule in psychology that seven is about the maximum people can handle. Well, let's be generous and make it nine. I try often to get it down to three parties and three goals. For heaven's sake, avoid two parties, one goal. If you think the conflict is Saddam Hussein against the rest of the world, you have probably gone off on a wrong tangent. Because if you do that, you have already polarized to bipolarization from the beginning. Keep it open, at least three by three. Now, having said that, mapping the conflict is the first. The second is legitimizing. You look at the goals that I stand for, and you ask yourself, are these goals legitimate? How do I know whether anything is legitimate? Well, I need three criteria. The first one is a rather flimsy and not very good one, law. The reason why it's not a very good is that it's usually an expression of upper class interests. And for that reason, very often unacceptable. But that's not always the case. It's usually status quo oriented, and it is quite obvious that if you want to resolve a deep conflict, you have to change the status quo. The case of Guatemala was mentioned, and I agree with the underlying statement that nothing has been done to remove the causes. 58% Mayas talking 19 different Maya dialects, being ruled over by Ladinos who have all the important cards to play with. And one heroic young girl, Maya girl, Rigoberto Manchu, just the fact that she exists was extremely positive. And for once, the Nobel Peace Prize Committee of my country made a good selection. The second criterion is human rights that we are celebrating tomorrow. They are a little bit more vague, they are not institutionalized, but they cover the last, the broad field. Remember that the Declaration of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is not international law. It's a declaration. International law came the 16th of December 1966 with the conventions. And the first one is civil political rights, and is to a large extent a repetition. That one has very much to do with direct conflict, with repression, with imposition of somebody else's culture. But the second convention is equally important, economic and social rights, that have to do with structural conflict. The first one is ratified by the United States of America. The second one is not ratified. We need both. There is an East Asian approach, which has been enacted by Japan, by Taiwan, by China. It's being enact been enacted by South Korea. It will be enacted by North Korea. Economic social rights first, civil political second. I'm not saying that I agree or disagree, I'm just saying this is a way of doing it. <clears throat> Lift people up from the indignity of misery. And then, as the Chinese say, opening up. The Chinese are now in the opening up phase. Human rights is a fantastic guide if you use the two conventions of 1966, not only one of them. But there is something that is even deeper than human rights, basic human needs. They are uncodified, controversial, non-institutionalized. I operate with Ford, based on extensive empirical research. 
survival, somatic well-being, freedom of the mind, and identity of the spirit. So to me, the human being is a combination of body, mind, and spirit, and these four basic needs apply to all of them. So let us now say that in order to answer the question of legitimation, I use all three, an element of law, element of human rights, an element of basic needs. And I listen to the parties, and I kick out some of their goals. If a party has an excessive desire for pipelines through Afghanistan and a base to prepare for the coming war with China, I call it illegitimate. And I would like to ask that party to analyze the conflict, if there is any, and try to see how it can be resolved. If a couple consisting of a businessman and a wife, both of them in the crisis age of 45, where the projects they are used to, love and sex and marriage and raising children and establishing a bourgeois style of life, have somehow become routinized. And the children have left the nest and she goes deeply into Buddhism and he loves his business and prefers black figures to red. Then I listen to them. They are quarreling like hell. One at a time. I see nothing illegitimate in wanting black figures if you run a business. And nothing illegitimate in wanting a rich inner life through Buddhism. What's the problem? Why can't she just do her business? He his business and she her meditation. Now you see that's not what I want. If that was the whole thing. They could now do what is known as separation under one roof. She has Buddhism in one corner of the house and he has accounting in the other corner and there's a line drawn across the table in the living room. You don't move your accounting books across that one and keep these Buddhist things away from me. And if you want to meditate, do it when I'm in the office. <clears throat> that would be a sloppy compromise. But what they wanted was not that. They wanted the other to convert to their position. They wanted their style to be the style, the program for the whole marriage. And the other resisted. Now, this is an important difference. It was a question of poverty. Who calls the theme of the marriage? My proposal was to run a Buddhist bookstore to get it. <laughs> In the meantime, they had, of course, established some relationships left and right. I think she went in for deep meditation with some man. And he probably hired a tandem bicycle in the woods or something of the kind. If you are mediating, you get stories. And by and large, after having done this for more than 50 years, I sometimes feel, can't I come up with something new? Because <laughs> I have heard most stories by now, I have a feeling. Anyhow, the Buddhist bookstore gave business to him Buddhism to her. I advised them to put 50% capital into it each. And after one week, she got an intense interest in black and red figures. <laughs> and he did something he had never thought he would do in his life. He read the Buddhist book. Now, you see what I'm doing. I try to understand the conflict. I try to design a project that is conflict sensitive, respecting the legitimate goals. He is in it, she is in it. And they reported to me that very quickly, the deep meditation somehow disappeared and the tandem bicycles westward, and they came together. 
And that made me think what a lousy job I have done. What a lousy job. Why didn't I think more of her lover and his mistress? I could have brought them together, you know. <laughs> have I, defining myself as so competent, defined it as a two-party conflict instead of a four-party? Yes, I confess, I did. So, there are always more parties than meets the naked eye. Ecuador, Peru, fighting high up in the Andes. La zona injusticiable. There was a zone which after the war in 41, where each country was supported by an American oil company, about oil deposits in the Amazonas, and Ecuador lost one third of its territory. It was a zone where they were unable to draw the border, and the war lasted 54 years, killing enormous amounts of people. I was called in, and yet I must say something. I have a tendency to be called in as a last resort. When things are absolutely hopeless, somebody says, there is this guy, what's his name again, Gotlong or something like that. There's this guy, I heard about him. So sometimes I wish that somebody could ask me to come to somewhat simpler conflicts. Anyhow, the ex-president of Ecuador and I met in one room in Guatemala. And he said, Professor Galtung, you have lived much in Latin America, you talk Spanish, you know the history of our war. How do we draw the border? We've been fighting four wars. And I said, Your Excellency, if I may propose one thing, would it be possible, and you see here you talk in the subjunctive mode, could you possibly think in terms of maybe one day coming to the tentative conclusion that you could ask a question about not drawing a border at all, but administering the zone together? Question mark. <laughs> This runs much better in Spanish than in English. English is a very bad mediation language. It is too, let us say, uh, descriptive. The French say placatif, too declaratory. Norwegian is equally bad. Japanese is also bad because nothing is plain and simple. Everything is to be doubted. And sometimes you have to make a statement with some clarity to it. The Latin languages are good. German is good. Anyhow, the ex-president said, I have been to these conferences for 30 years. Nobody has ever proposed it. Very creative, Professor Galtung, but too creative. It will take us at least 30 years to get used to the idea and 30 more years to realize it. It took three years. After three years, the peace treaty in 1998 became exactly that. That zone has now lasted for 12 years. There hasn't been one shot fired in anger, nothing. It's been a very clear success. What was happening? Well, they both wanted access to that zone. They both wanted to own it. And one of them said, I love hiking. If I hike up in that zone, according to your plan, Will I meet Peruvians? And I said, yes, you will meet Peruvians, because they also love hiking. I don't like Peruvians. It's a clear statement. So I said then, and this is a little sense of humor might help. You can do it the way the airplanes do it, you see. You do it from 4,500 to 5,000 meters. And he has 5,000 to 5,500 5, meters. Then there is a 500 meters for Ecuadorians again, things like that. And then he said, now look, that's ridiculous. <laughs> With some training, I can start loving Peruvians. Notice now that you don't start with loving Peruvians, you start with the solution. Don't think that you can change their feelings and that's the solution. The solution is political in the real world. Things have to happen. A Buddhist bookstore is not exact an innovation in this world, but for new for them. 
In other words, something new has to be brought in. A zone of that kind was actually the first one. It is in Antarctic, some colonial powers had practiced it, but otherwise it was the first one. Others had been working on it too. But I know that in 1998, when I was called in for the detailed discussion with the admiral staff and the general staff of Ecuador, it was a mediator's delight. Because I was grilled eight hours about details. I knew this means we are in business. And when I didn't have an answer, you of course just honestly say, I don't know. But I think there is a method for exploring an answer. So what happens when one guy kills another guy in a binational zone? Which legal code applies? Interesting, and you can have lawyers going on for centuries discussing that one, and you can produce a whole library of books about it. So it's a good pastime for the legal profession. Or you can say you apply the law depending on who is the perpetrator of the act, and you apply his law. I mean, there are many answers to it, and these answers are interesting, because this is a globalizing world, and we will have many zones of that type. So, legitimacy. I came to the conclusion that Ecuador has a legitimate claim and Peru has a legitimate claim. Now, if both of them have a legitimate claim to the same thing, you have a problem, don't you? Well, they could own it together. Now, if two women have a legitimate claim to the same man or two men to the same woman, we may have a problem, we may also have not. I'm not going to indicate any solution. Depends on your creativity. There is a French one called Menage à Trois, <laughs> which is one possibility. I'm not indicating anything, but I'm just saying that it starts your little mind moving. You need empathy, you need nonviolence, you need creativity. Because you're now moving from legitimizing to bridging. And bridging means that you have legitimate goals on both sides, or three sides, or four sides. And your task is to construct that thing above them that would make them feel comfortable, the overarching one. So we have three stages, mapping, traditional social science. Legitimizing, you have to know some law, human rights, ethics the thinking behind basic needs, the human body, the human mind, the human spirit. You have to know all of this, you have to be at home in it. Bridging is an entirely different thing. It's intuition, creativity. It's close to art. So where do you have that school where you learn social science, law, human rights, ethics, philosophy, and art at the same time? The John Croc Institute, of course. It's the answer to it. Can you teach creativity? Yes, you can. You can. You can give lots of examples. You can have exercises in it. And I would strongly recommend it. We have an experience. We have a big project, actually, in Norway called Sabona. Sabona is a Sulu word, which means I see you, I take you in. Not on, but in. And the greeting is Sabona. I take you in. You are part of me, I'm part of you, the Ubuntu spirit. Our experience is that kids from 8 to 12 learn this almost immediately. I don't like that guy. He's always troubling me. And the point is made that, well, why don't you find out why he is so troublesome? What does he want? Ask him. And if you don't like to talk with him, have somebody else ask him. And you may find that what he wants is actually not so unreasonable. And you can sit down and find a way in which you can gel, the things can come together. They understand this immediately and love it. And they say, how much more interesting. 
then two equations of the first degree. 3x plus 4y equals 7, 2x minus 5y equals 0. Fascinating, of course, absolutely fascinating. But even more fascinating, Ecuador and Peru wanting the same territory. Bad boy is destroying of a snowman. And you ask, find out why does it do it? Nobody invited me to be playing. Mm -hmm. Should we give him a try? Should we try once? You can say that's a simple thing. But the Norwegian foreign ministry, when they were trying to do something in Israel-Palestine, they invited left-wing Israel and right-wing Palestine. And left-wing Palestine and right-wing Israel were not invited to be playing. Maybe they destroyed the snowman. Maybe right-wing Israel killed the prime minister. And maybe left-wing Palestine started with suicide belts. It's exactly what they did. Aha, we are not invited. You will be hearing from us. Don't get into the excuse me to be plain, frank, American nonsense of calling them spoilers. It's simply because you have forgotten to ask them. They are problematic. And they may change your little scheme because they may bring in new perspectives. Get them in. Have us a line that we will never talk with Taliban, Hamas, Hezbollah, and you will reap the consequences. Consequences are now clear to everybody. So, if we now go on from there, I try to summarize. The method is one-on-one -on -one dialogue. Point one, mapping. Point two, legitimizing. Point three, bridging, going on with the legitimate goals. For this, you need point one, empathy, point two, nonviolence. You don't critique the parties. You don't moralize. I know of very few cases where somebody has become good because he has been told he's bad. The approach is a different one that we call triple C. Be constructive, concrete, and creative. Try to show that there is a way out. Do not be afraid. Don't be afraid of proposing things. If you are a good mediator, you will have hundreds of indicated solutions before the parties do. Don't assume that they know their own situation and no possibilities. Any mediator worth a grain of salt will have enough experience, partly self-made, partly from literature, to be a walking, ambulating laboratory of solutions. Don't be afraid of proposing, but don't command. Propose them with question mark in the subjunctive mode. Make them fascinating as points on the menu for discussion, dialogue. Having said that, let's move straight to Afghanistan. Make a little jump. It's my major concern, in and out, Washington, Afghanistan. Uh, nothing easy. So the first thing you do is that you ask the Taliban what you want. As a matter of fact, I have a way of formulating that question, which moves quite well. It's a general formulation that I recommend. What does the Afghanistan look like where you would like to live? What does the Middle East look like where you would like to live? What does the marriage look like where you would like to be a party? What does the Andes Mountains high up look like that you would like to see? In other words, you contextualize the goal, and that contextualization is important. They'll tell you. I don't think I have my 50 years experience almost not met anybody who is not more than willing to talk. The point is not that I don't talk, but that I talk too much. And uh, you have sooner or later to find a way of gently moving the conversation on. 
The parties will, of course, start with saying how bad the other is. And you say, uh, 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 wait with that one. I guarantee you it's on the agenda. But I would like to hear what you want, not how bad the other is. After that, when you have told me how bad the other is, I might like to ask you, was there sometimes in the past when the situation was good? Yes, he was nice to start with, but he was a hypocrite. Could you tell me an example of hypocrisy? Was it nice hypocrisy or bad hypocrisy? Give me an example. So. And I might like to ask about what are you most afraid of for the future? I'm afraid that the Zionists will continue expanding forever. I'm afraid that they will throw us into the sea. Now, this combination of positive-negative, past-future is a very powerful dialogue agenda, extremely powerful. So you ask the Taliban, what do they say? They say, we want three things. And they're not necessarily the Taliban. Point one, we want Islam. We are dead against secularization. <coughs> that incidentally throws out almost all the development projects because they come from infidels. And to believe that water is neutral is naive. No school is neutral. It's a question of who is running it in whose name. Is it in the name of Allah the Merciful? Or is it in the name of some project coming from the West? Point two, we hate Kabul. We want a decentralized Afghanistan. We are 20,000 villages in a mountainous country. We are poor. We are seven, eight nations. We don't want to be run from Kabul by a Pashtun Tajik alliance connected to foreign powers that run the system through Kabul. Point three, we are sick and tired of being invaded. We had enough. Now, here you have three very clear goals. Their own identity, a decentralized society, and not being invaded. They seem to me legitimate. I have no problems with them. I have problems with other things they do, but not with that one. You look at the US side, what are the goals? A base for a possible coming war with China and an oil pipeline. These, ladies and gentlemen, are the basic goals. That's the text, the subtext, the deep text, the supertext, and the context. If you add up all of that, you get the pretext. <laughs> and for your information, I'll be among those writing the post text to this. Now, the pretext is, of course, the blah blah that comes out later. I'm not saying there couldn't be sincerity in it. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that you have a conflict with three highly legitimate goals posited against two illegitimate. How do you solve that one? We had a mediation in February 2001 before the war started. The war started October 7, 2001. The mediation couldn't be inside Afghanistan. It was under Taliban brutality. It was in Peshawar with Taliban in the room, 100 persons in the room, one third cabinet members, former, one third sheikhs, one third professors, not very useful, and 10 ladies. When I say that thing about my own group, my own class, it's because professors have a tendency to confuse books with reality. <laughs> it's not quite the same thing. There is a difference. For instance, reality walks on two legs and talks. The libraries don't do that. <laughs> so there is some difference. Having said that, 
out of this one week mediation by a Canadian Norwegian group of Transcend, the organization I founded together with Dietrich Fischer in 1993 and my wife, came five conclusions that I stand by today. And I'm trying to make them known to the actors and succeed in that. Number one, a coalition government. A former prime minister said the Taliban have to be in it. They are the moral nerve of our country. If you don't have Taliban, you'll get heroin and corruption. 100% Taliban is intolerable. 0% is a stupidity. So I said, how about 20? He said 18. I said, how about 19? He laughed, I laughed. I tried to bring in that you can be light with your wording. You can play on it. You can curl your lips in a genuine smile. You can laugh. You can laugh with your eyes and your body language, but be careful, be careful. Point two, Afghanistan as a loose federation with very much local autonomy. The country in the world most similar to Afghanistan is Switzerland. That's a country that should play a med major mediation role. They are even similar in the sense, you see, two very important senses, that the parts of Switzerland are replications of the context. Germany, Germans in Switzerland, Italy, Italians in Switzerland. And then there is a Swiss part which is genuinely Swiss, the Ladino talking people, like the Hazara in Afghanistan. Otherwise, they are replications of the context. Now, this means a federation with a capital in a small city, town, not Kabul. The third part is a confederation with the bordering countries. Afghanistan is in them and they are in Afghanistan. Confederation means community. It means a Central Asian community. That would be the five former Soviet Central Asian republics, Pakistan, Iran, and Azad Kashmir. If you add up all of that, you have eight countries in the context and Afghanistan. Afghanistan as a neutral country like Switzerland. Point four. Priority to basic needs. That means food, water. Grown the way they find culturally compatible. It means education and health and shelter. It means education for all the nations and both genders. The Taliban are changing. They realize that their approach is wrong. But they tell me again and again the same thing. Yes, we made mistakes, but we are not going to be told that by Americans or by feminists, and particularly not by American feminists. <laughs> now, gentlemen, don't laugh too loudly at that one. The ladies are listening and they're taking note of your laughter, so be careful now. You see, <clears throat> to whom? Do we listen, they say, to our brothers and sisters who are ahead of us? Which are the advanced countries among the 56 Muslim countries? Tunisia, number one. Since 1956, parity between the genders. It's a remarkable country. Turkey, very important. Indonesia, the southern part of the Philippines. They are more than willing to take the message. But remember, this is an isolated country up in the Hindu Kush, isolated from the world. Don't expect the waves of the world to reach them immediately. Don't blame them for being 50 years behind. There are many countries that are 50 or more years behind in many regards. You cannot assume 
that all countries in the world are synchronized. Now they help them, and the way to help them is to facilitate their dialogue with those four countries I mentioned. Point five, internal security. It's an extremely violent culture. The violence is linked to what they call insults. You can also say unresolved conflicts. So I remember when we were asked to come back to Kabul for a session with the Minister of Education about reducing violence in Afghanistan and introducing peace studies in the schools. We were asking for examples of violence. What's the kind of insult that would lead to violence? And the woman who was Minister of Education, a very gentle, fine lady, said, well, <clears throat> you are driving on a highway and somebody passes you. A clear insult. <laughs> very clear case. The reaction is violent. You have a gun in your glove compartment. What else do you have glove compartment for? Not for gloves, it's a pistol compartment. <laughs> dang, dang. And the two back tires are flat. So we asked how much time between the insult and the violent reaction. She said about five seconds. It doesn't give you too much time for mediation, you know? In the subjunctive mode with creativity, empathy, <laughs> nonviolence, and all that jazz. Not too much time. So we chose another approach. What happens if somebody says, does not react violently? And she said, somebody will say, you're not a man. And I remember I said, this one I have heard before, this one I know, that one we know, even we Canadians and Norwegians have heard that one. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen of the Ministry of Education, sit down at the ten tables. Who can come up with the best answer when somebody says you are not a man? The Minister of Education says, the first time in Afghan history this has been seen as a matter of social conversation. And I said, if you have only five seconds, the answer has to be very short. Well, the gold medal went to, so what? Question mark. And the silver medal went to something that the Spanish speaking in the audience will understand immediately. That's your problem, not my problem. Eso es su problema, no es mi problema. That's a little bit too long. It eats up too much of the five seconds. <laughs> How successful this has been, I don't know. I'm just illustrating it's a violent country. How do you handle that? By peacekeeping. Who can keep the peace? <laughs> not USA, not UK, not NATO, not ISAF. Infidels all with more or less hidden agendas the brothers and sisters from the Muslim world. More or less the same countries, incidentally. And they could combine it by telling about parity between genders. It's the kind of thing I'm peddling. The kind of thing. I remember sitting in the Rayburn, Sam Rayburn building next to the US Congress with very famous Congress people. It belongs to my game that I never tell names. They said, Johan, fascinating. We have not heard this. CIA has never told us what Taliban stands for. Never. But how can we bring this to the American voter? They're not interested in conflict solution, they're interested in one thing, winning. Are we winning or losing? No, to promise them victory. The V word. And I said, are you sure of that? Or could it be that you haven't found the pedagogy? Could it be that you engage with the American voters and do it differently? Could it be that you tell media to approach this in a different way? Let me stop that line of reasoning because I'm now coming to a rather important point, which is the following. What are the options for the US in this situation? Let me first say, I ask you to look at the map. 
which are the countries around Afghanistan thinking the kind of way that I have introduced you to? Well, they are on an axis from Turkey, Istanbul, Ankara, to Shanghai, Beijing, China. China and Turkey are major actors. So is Iran. So is half of Pakistan. Maybe the half many people don't like. So what now are the US options? Victory is out. I'll give you two reasons why it has been out all the time, maybe three reasons. You're fighting three wars at the same time. Again, something defined as Muslim extremism, which in some cases is exactly that. But it's also people who just honestly have their faith. Against the decentralization and the local autonomy, and against people sick and tired of being invaded, like they have been five times in the modern era. Point two. There are 1,560 Muslims in the world, and they are obligated by the Quran to defend Islam by the sword when trampled upon. Remember, for them, the borders between Islamic countries are fake. They are drawn by us. Reality is the Ummah, the community of the believers. When they flow into Afghanistan, they're not crossing a border. They are moving inside the Ummah. Point three. There is nothing called capitulation in Islam to infidels. If you hope for some kind of rickety, some tent with some rickety camping equipment and a secretary and signed on the dotted line and things of that type, you are living in a world of fantasy. There may be some local capitulation. Islam will never capitulate to anything else than an other Islamic country, like Iran ultimately did to Iraq. They will not capitulate to infidels. If you want a war for eternity, please go on. It's been unwinnable from day one, from 7 October 2001. And the Prime Minister I quoted told me when we had come to the five-point plan that this plan is something of the best I've ever seen. The only problem is it cannot be realized because the U.S. is going to invade us in October. He said that in February. Now February happens to be seven months before 9-11. Why? Because they want a base for the coming war with China, and they want a pipeline from Turkmenistan down to the Indian Ocean via Afghanistan, Pakistan. Evidently, he was well informed, to put it that way. I looked at what was written under the finger when he was pointing to the map. This is where they want a base. It was written Bagram, of course. Um, if you mediate, you may very quickly become much better informed than media, much better informed. And I repeat, the rule of the game is it's non-attributable. Having said that, you are now in a situation where victory is impossible. Defeat is impossible. The option, the alternative to defeat is withdrawal. So you have this strange president at the time who is trying to ride on a number of horses at the same time, Republican horses, Democratic horses. I guess that soon he will have riding on a Tea Party horse too. And I have by that shared with you my skepticism about him. Too pragmatic. Having said that, which is in a sense irrelevant, the thing that I would hope for the United States to do would be to join conflict resolution. I've indicated points, others have other points. Call a conference for security and cooperation in Central Asia. Not 
run by USA, by Central Asian countries. So, ladies and gentlemen, your task is to make America love conflict resolution. There is nothing that particularly tricky about it. But you have to learn the secret to it. The other side might have a legitimate point of view. And if you try to combine it with your own, don't give up your own. And you try to be creative, you may get out of it so much more than victory. As a matter of fact, when I ask people high up, what is your goal? <clears throat> to win. And I then say, what happens then? Well, then it's over, they will understand they have lost. If you had lost, would you have understood that you have lost? No, but I'm made of a different material than these bastards. Well, it takes about five minutes to turn that guy around, to understand that he is in for problems. So let me just say, mediation is to paint on the wall a vision so attractive that the parties say, look, it's not exactly what I was hoping for, but I can go for that one. I can walk in the Andes even if I meet Peruvians. My husband doesn't have to become a Buddhist if he can work together on a Buddhist bookstore. I would like him to read a book. My hysterical wife, esoteric hysterical wife, who is shouting and crying about not mediation but meditation all the time, if she could only get a little sense of business, that would help a lot. In other words, you see the other party as somebody with whom you could work. I don't call it win-win, I call it transcendence. And the reason for that is that you have to go beyond the present reality into something new. One of the reasons why Americans are not good at this internationally is conservatism. They don't want anything new, they're afraid of something new. You should enjoy it. A zone in the Andes Mountains does not change the world radically. But it could be the beginning of something. So, ladies and gentlemen, good luck to you. Thanks that this institution exists. <laughs>